Welcome back to The World This Week here on France 24 in partnership with The Daily Beast. Here with me to look back at the top stories of the last seven days, Christopher Dickey, foreign editor at The Daily Beast, Judah Grunstein, editor-in-chief of World Politics Review. I'm also joined by freelance journalists and writer Anne Penketh. And last but not least, France 24's Annette Young. Now, before the break, we were discussing President Donald Trump's first foreign tour since taking office. We're going to head now to the United Kingdom, where the US Secretary of State Rex Tillerson has been paying a visit today, where he's been patching up ties with his British opposite number, Boris Johnson, after confidential information relating to the police investigation into Monday's deadly attack in Manchester was published in the American media. That's after being leaked, presumably, by the US intelligence services, while the British Interior Minister, Amber Rudd, said that for now, the terror threat level there in the UK is going to remain at its highest, uh, at the critical level. Well, on Thursday, the city of Manchester fell silent, remembering the 22 <clears throat> people who lost their lives, many of them teenagers. Um, that was, of course, uh, a reminder of the very real terror threat uh, that we face here in Europe. And let me start with you, Anne, because, of course, Manchester is, is a city uh, you know extremely well. Yes, yes. Um, I was brought up uh, very close to Manchester and, and my parents now still live only about 30 miles um, away. I go there a lot. Um, and in fact, my, my brother was working there when there was the last terrorist um, atrocity, which was the IRA, um, 21 years ago. So it, it kind of brought that, brought that back and it was in the centre of Manchester, but different, different times Different, different threat, and now we we have these these Libyans who have um, a, a, quite a large community in in Manchester ar around the south, um, and so it's a homegrown um, threat that we are that we are uh, dealing with now. Indeed, and, and this issue of, of of Libya has has been very much a focal point of the investigation. It's, it's sort of much of the uh, the links are sort of taking us back to Libya. And this issue has then been politicised by certain uh, leaders in the United Kingdom, notably uh, Jeremy Corbyn, the leader of the Labour Party, who says words to the effect of what were we doing uh, in Libya in the first place? And, and, it's, and it's somehow the fault of, of the British government that this attack took place. That hasn't gone down very well, has it? Yes, he's, he said that this morning. It's, well, people do generally know that that is, that is his position ever since the Iraq war, um, in which it was said that Tony Blair and George Bush were the, the recruiting sergeants for ISIS after, after the invasion. And then I must say, when I, when I heard that it was a, a Libyan who had carried out this this heartbreaking attack on the on the concert goers, um, I thought, well, you know, th th there is a, a big foreign policy angle to this because we, the West, um, did go in. Um, we persuaded the Russians not to veto um, a UN resolution, and then we left chaos behind in in Libya. And it seems that the, the bomber has been back and forth between uh, Libya, that his, his father is there now, and his, his younger brother as well. Well, all of us, of course, are residents of Paris. And every time, uh, you know, we see a headline like that one, a breaking news alert, it brings back, uh, you know, all those memories come flooding back, don't they, of, of, of what happened uh, exactly. much closer to, to, to our home right now. I, I think what we're finding, or at least what I personally am, am experiencing, is that each time the, the shock and the horror are the same, but it's no longer a surprise. Mm -hmm. This is something we've learned to accept that we're going to have to live with. And so we're not surprised. And, and the truth is that even in the most successful uh, counter-terrorist approach or, or, or strategy, uh, it, nothing can ever be 100% successful. So there will always, uh, there will always be a failure. The, the, the tragic part is that a failure can lead to either the loss of s several lives or many. Uh, and at the same time, uh, knowing that each failure leads to future successes for the counter-terrorist program in the sense of tracing communications, wrapping up cells that in support networks, it's, it's, not, it, it's, it's small consolation, obviously, and the human element of these stories remains as immense for each, for each time. But for me personally, what, what I find is that there's, there's little new to say in terms of how to respond to it afterward. Um, in terms of Libya, we could get into Libya and Iraq, especially the, the causes uh, of, of the, the sort of regional disorder in the Middle East that's feeding it in, in among homegrown populations. But that to me is 
uh, yeah. the the reaction. But when I, I think see something like I think this. there's a I think there's a mistake that's commonly made, and I think Jeremy Corbyn's making it, where you take the macro issue, and then you make that the absolute cause, the reason for the micro problem of terrorism. Terrorism is a big issue, but the people who carry out terrorist actions are parts of very small groups. This, and in this case, one reason the group was not penetrated is because there was all the same family, pretty much, uh, which is something we've seen in other places. But we are not talking, if we're talking, uh, I don't know how many people of Libyan descent there are in Manchester, but let's say there are 50,000 there. What are we talking about? We're talking about five, 10? Well, so, you're, you're also talking about quite quite a few uh, recruiters, though, that, who, who were You're talking about recruiters, Libyan, which, but if, which but we if have you, now you're talking about recruiters, but how is it that they recruit? Who do they go after? They go after, I, I will give Trump this, they go after losers. They, their, their, their winners are losers. But uh, I, I think what, what's also interesting about this is the fact that we're now getting soft targets in cities in the regions. You know, mm -hmm. it's now Manchester which I know well because my father comes from Macclesfield, up the road. Mm. Um, and it's, it's the last place, to be frank, that most people in the UK would have thought of being a terrorist target. Having said that, it is a very multicultural city um, and that feeds into the homegrown element yeah, of all but this. The other element of that, and that is that it's getting harder to hit the big targets, the big cities. Sure. It's harder to hit New York City, so you will see terrorism hitting in, in other secondary cities in the States. Harder to hit London, you see secondary cities. Harder to hit Paris, you see attacks in Normandy. But they're trying, they're part, that's part of the message of the, the, the extremists. They want to say you're not safe anywhere. Well, well it's also we can't hit you in the cities the and way we could before, and so we're going to hit you. But I think as well, to come back to what you're, what you're saying about the, the Corbyn thing, which I think is, is, is really important, that that is really beside the point, actually, what, what Corbyn is saying, because um, it fuels the propaganda from these people who are it is, ruthless. It is the propaganda. It is the propaganda of these people. And if, yes. if we'd let uh, Gaddafi commit a mm. massacre uh, at the time, that would have fueled the propaganda also, that, that we stand by and let Muslims die. Now, <coughs> one thing I would like to say just about, about this particular attack, that I feel like there's a, a, a something of a shift in the reaction to it, which is that we're not trying to figure out what the message is. This This one goes so far beyond any sort of message or logic. Uh, when, you, when I saw the, the message from uh, ISIS claiming responsibility and they called a uh, preteen and teenage girls a gathering of crusaders, it, it's, so f it's so disconnected that in some way I think it's, it's made it clear we, we, after, after the previous waves of attacks, there was a big uh, sort of trend trying to figure out how to how to counter radicalization how to how to block radicalization right. i think we're understanding that there's no one path to radicalization there's no one logic for what makes one loser susceptible and well, another loser less I mean, susceptible but i uh, think i think you can look at the profiles of these guys again and again and you see common elements again and again you see it's young guys you see that they identify with a narrative often now that they've acquired uh, over the internet that they've seen or maybe they've heard from their family in the case of libyans and they want to project themselves on the world stage. These are the things that they want to do. I did a profile because the psychological exams were, were uh, unsealed in the, in the federal courts of Dylan Roof, the man who killed uh, nine people at a Bible study class in Charleston, South Carolina, because they were black for no other reason. And there's lots of arguments. Was he autistic? What, was he mentally ill? We don't even have those arguments mm -hmm. about these guys when, when we can identify them as Muslims. But in fact, he's a paradigm for the kind of a loser that is recruited by uh, terrorist recruiters. But, there's an, but or, he's got another thing. For that matter, white supremacy. But he's got another thing in common with all of the other people we've talked about up until now as well over the years. He was known to the authorities here in France. It's called having an S file. You know, you're on a watch list. And then we hear from the authorities, you can't watch everybody. Well, and I think, well, yes, but I think one of the things that, that we have to look at with this case is that when you have somebody buying large quantities of peroxide, that's, a, that's an alarm. That's the kind of thing that you watch for. Now, 
if it was Anne or Judah or Annette buying peroxide, that would be suspicious. But also, but if you're already behavior. being watched, but the and you're behavior, buying it. But maybe you're guy. wanting to bleach your hair, Chris. I mean, yeah, who knows? Well, but, but not if you're not if you're already some on their list. But what was interesting, and just picking up on what Tom said, is that a number of people local authorities included, have been alerted about sus suspicious behaviour on the part of this young By man. By his friends. By his By friends. Saying he'd themselves. been talking and praising suicide bombings. The reality is, how do you deal with this homegrown threat? It comes back to what you're saying, the losers as such, but the sheer numbers of these people well, and, as Tom well, just well, said... Well, what are the sheer numbers in that? I don't know what the sheer numbers are. 3,000 people in, in the On UK. a watch list. Oh, no, 3,000 people yeah, on a watch that's list? A, and, and then when you have a government who is cutting you... back money to local policing. I mean, it all feeds into this. It has, it's going to have to take some extraordinarily innovative thinking on the mm. part of governments. But what, the reason I bring up peroxide, because it's a component of TATP, the explosive that he used, is because precisely because you can't follow everybody all the time, mm. you have to have certain triggers that you watch for. That is such an obvious one. And you know, I wrote a book about the New York City Police Department's counterterror operations. And that's something they always watch for, is acquiring precursor chemicals for explosives. Why weren't they watching for that with this guy? It's a question of putting the two things together. That doesn't take huge resources. And this is all happening in the context of a general election in just a couple of weeks from now in the UK. Um, we're going to have to move on, but I just want to ask, before we, uh, we finish that topic, uh, Julia, I mean, just going back to what we said at the beginning about the the intelligence gaffe there, the leak, we presume, by the US uh, intelligence services to the US media, revealing details about the investigation to what happened there in Manchester. Do you think the damage is uh, uh, serious that's been done between London and Washington? Uh, I think the, 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 damage, the damage is always serious in the short term. Uh, we've seen other uh, pretty high profile uh, cases in, in the past five years, uh, whether it's uh, from WikiLeaks re revelations or Snowden or things like that, uh, that have been uh, managed to have been dealt with by, by uh, between, for instance, Germany, France and the U.S. So I believe that uh, in the long term, the partnership will, will obviously survive and thrive. Uh, there, there's a question now of uh, the, one of the big uh, components of combating a transnational terrorist threat is sharing intelligence and sharing information. For that, there has to be trust. So there has to be some measurable gauges from the United States right now to the British uh, intelligence services, uh, reassuring them that the channels can be reopened. Okay, and just but, the last but, word. But to reveal the name of a, of a bomber during a live investigation. I mean, that is really unacceptable. And so for me, the question is why? And I think what's interesting about that is that it shows there is such a rift now between they wanted to get back at Donald Trump. Well, or, or the terrorism is his stock and trade. It's what made him as a candidate, fear. He was the candidate of fear. So is it to get back at Donald Trump or is it people who work for Donald Trump? Well, the, okay. the other alternative is that there's such a frenzy right now in terms of intelligence leaks. I almost get the sense that probably people were so used to feeding intelligence leaks to their favorite journalists at The Post and The New York Times that they just sort of sent this one along without actually realizing, oh, wait, this has nothing to do with sinking Donald Trump on the Russia investigation. This could actually cost some lives because uh, people, in, people in will cases, escape the In most cases, it could be a net. simple gaffe in that sense. Mm. effectively, as opposed to uh, an act of conspiracy, I suspect. OK, we're going to have to move on from Manchester. We're going to move now to another uh, deadly attack that took place this week. Uh, it took place on Friday in Egypt, where more than 20 people have been killed. Following on from what is the latest in what's been a series of attacks targeting the country's minority Christian community. This is they travelled by bus to visit a monastery in the south of the country. Annette, now, I know you've been uh, following this story very closely. What more do we know at this stage? Um, what we do know is that uh, there were gunmen in three military vehicles actually dressed in uniforms who uh, approached the bus and then began shooting. And uh, as a result, uh, these people were killed. Uh, the group were heading towards a monastery as part of a Christian pilgrimage. Uh, this area, I think, has a Christian population roughly around 35%. From memory, it is probably the biggest attack of its type directed towards uh, the Christian community in this particular province. I mean, of course, you had the bombings back in April, which as a result of which uh, President uh, al-Sisi has declared a state of emergency 
uh, since then and uh, now we're in a situation where obviously we're waiting to see if indeed the Islamic State group does indeed claim responsibility as they have done previously and Chris Dickey is nodding there somewhat wisely because the odds are it probably was them given that they've made it very clear that Christians are their prey um, and we've certainly seen the worst of their behaviour haven't we Chris in places such as North Sinai. Sure I mean I think one of the questions that comes up uh, is is this, why are they doing this? Why are they attacking Christians? Yes, there is an ideological religious reason, but this is a way of saying again and again that uh, General al-Sisi, President al-Sisi, is not really in control of the country. He was promising to bring order to Egypt and he is not bringing order to Egypt. That's the big message for them. Uh, but in terms of who they recruit and how they recruit to carry out these kinds of atrocities, that's taught on the basis of fighting against the Crusaders, as they like to say. So we had little girls slaughtered in Manchester, labeled Crusaders. We have cops slaughtered in, uh, in uh, Egypt, uh, labeled Crusaders. And I think we'll, and this is all an effort to create uh, eventually a civil war, truly a clash of civilizations. That is exactly what they want. And uh, I think we are moving in that direction. And I think, in fact, the losers are winning. And what's happening in Egypt, which is, very, you know, in terms of it's effectively sandwiched between now the Sinai, which has become effectively a no-go zone, and the chaos that's happening in Libya as such. And where there is chaos is fertile territory for jihadist activity. So uh, it feeds into all of this. But I think it should be said, though, that attacks on, on, on the cops have been going on since, since Mubarak. And uh, Morsi, it continued, <clears throat> and now President Sisi. So none, none of them really seem to be able to stop it. Not except the that scale now, clearly, of the scale <clears throat> is different now. Yes. Uh, but, and this despite the fact that our Sisi very much campaigned as the friendly candidate for the Coptic community, who of course felt very much unprotected by the Muslim Brotherhood, to the point that he attended a uh, mass, I think it was the first time ever, by an Egyptian president in 2015. But as these attacks continue, obviously the, there are many in the Christian uh, community, and particularly in the Coptic community, who feel that mm. uh, his promises are somewhat empty. Yeah, and uh, we've heard actually from, from Muslim leaders there in Egypt saying this is all part <coughs> of a plan, uh, as you've been saying, to, to try and destabilise uh, Egypt. We're running out of time, and we're going to move on now to our uh, final story. They called him Bond, James Bond. And for 12 years, Roger Moore played the part of perhaps the world's best-known secret agent. But it was announced on Tuesday that the actor had died at the age of 89 after a short battle with cancer. Well, before we talk very briefly about his life and times, let's listen to what Roger Moore himself thought about his career as 007. Sadly, I had to retire from Bond because the girls were all getting too young. Or I was getting too old, I can't remember which, but it looked rather disgusting. It was like love in the afternoon. OK, Roger Moore there, who died at the age of 89 on Tuesday. Um, we're not going to talk very long about uh, uh, Roger Moore, but Jodrick, rather you had, a, you had a poster of his. Uh, yeah, well, I was a teenager for the Roger Moore years, so the, the posters were definitely tailor-made for a teenage boy's uh, imagination. <laughs> uh, Do you remember but... what it was? Uh, yeah, I do. But... Oh, <laughs> I do you know, it was, well, it was actually the that. most awful James Bond movie title of all time. It was, I believe, Octopussy. Oh, okay. uh, it, was, uh, it was a very uh, long-legged woman fit taking a picture from behind with uh, Roger Moore in the distance. They were all like that, I think. <laughs> okay, well, Obviously. he was a fictitious spy, but did he have, did he bring sort of, you know, he captured the spirit, didn't he, pretty well of, of the age of the 70s and the 80s, the Cold War in its peak and perhaps a uh, history repeating itself right now what do you think yeah well i think he was a, he was part of that cold war scene that was the context in which spying took place although even then there was a lot of talk about specter and uh, and these other organizations cuz people got bored with smirsh and with uh, with the with the soviet thing uh, for me sean connery was james mm. bond uh, from russia with love talk about a cold war movie <laughs> from russia with love Great movie, and and that changed my life. I, th I think it's it's pretty obvious, and I believe Roger Moore himself either admitted it or would have. He was made for the role, and the role was made for him. He couldn't really play too much, uh, too much further afield than a very sophisticated and suave secret agent. It was obviously a different style than Sean Connery or even than today's uh, 
James Bonds, but uh, but Daniel he did Craig. do it with a sense of humour, and he said that himself in one of his last interviews because he could never take himself seriously anyway. Mm. So that was how he was going to play the role. Okay, we're almost out of time. Just the last word: uh, Who's going to say their favourite uh, Roger Moore uh, portrayal of James Bond? Any film uh, stick in your mind? Anything? They all Leap kind of blended the into each other in that period. It was all one I, film. There was yeah. Moonraker, right, I, with Jaws. I saw them no, all, but Sean Connery is still the best. Okay, no. well, I thought it was a few eyes only, so I've had the last word in this discussion. <laughs> That's all we have time for for this edition of The World This Week in partnership with The Daily Beast. Thank you very much indeed to my guests today, Christopher Dickey, Judah Grunstein, Anne Penketh, and Annette Young. Thank you very much indeed to you as well for watching. Stay tuned to France 24. Okay, it's time now for our edition of Media Watch. Emma James joins me in the studio. Hello, Emma. Uh, you've been looking at what's happening online, in particular uh, with regard to the latest stop on Donald Trump's uh, international tour. Yes, well, not quite the latest, because a lot of people are still looking at what he was saying yesterday while he was in Brussels. Uh, the fallout from this, I think, is going to continue uh, to rumble around. The repercussions of it are pretty huge. Uh, one of the most interesting articles to take a look at is from Der Spiegel, the international version, uh, where it's headlined, it's time to get rid of Donald Trump. <laughs> Klaus Brinkbaumer not mincing his words at all in this article. It is brilliantly written, really, really interesting. Of course, this was in response to Donald Trump calling calling Germans bad, very bad, and vowing to curb their imports of cars to the United States. Uh, now, what he says in this article, and we've got some of the highlights, really, uh, in some of the uh, tweets that have been sent out by people, because people are fascinated by this article. Um, an immature boy sits on the throne of the most important country in the world. He could at any time issue a catastrophic order that would immediately be carried out. Um, that is why the parents cannot afford to take their eyes off him even for a second. They ultimately have to send him to his room and return power to the grown-ups. Uh, and this line here as well is unbelievable. He is a man free of morals, as has been demonstrated hundreds of times he is a liar a racist and a cheat so don't mess with the germans i think is the uh, what you can sum that up as um lots of people really saying now that if anyone is the leader of the free world it's mm. angela merkel after trump's multi-shambles in brussels yesterday it is indisputable uh, that's certainly the view of quite a few people when you look online this was an interesting little insight as well uh, just got this text from a republican national security official and apparently he said had to apologize to a european defense attaché just now i'm sorry he's an idiot this is just not what you ever imagine is going to happen at these kind of gatherings normally they're really quite boring, to be fair. Um, they're sort of, they gather for their family photos and they all chat a bit. And there's never normally something to, to really get your teeth into in terms of laughing, frankly. Um, and it does seem that the world is laughing at the United States right now. The New Yorker says uh, at NATO headquarters, Trump fails another leadership test. Uh, Politico, too, has this headline. Trump at NATO, he came, he saw, he harangued. Mm. Um, and they have a list of some of what they call his tremendous moments. So uh, that's <laughs> definitely a tongue-in-cheek way to refer to it. Um, and of course, what Politico flag up is the fact that he actually referred to Brussels as uh, as being a hellhole. Uh, now, among the supposedly tremendous uh, moments, we did talk about it a little bit yesterday, uh, this shove of the Prime Minister of Montenegro to en enable himself to get to the front of this group. I think that's been exaggerated and did the same thing to me as we were heading into the studio today. <laughs> but it's interesting that, that people almost expected of him. Uh, this Twitter user saying, no, silly, that's just a locker room shove. <laughs> Nothing Trump does is offensive if you put locker room in front of it. Now, Stephen Colbert has gone one further. He's comparing this really to um, another Trump, uh, well, media extravaganza, shall we say. I've got a little clip. Let's take a look. Get the hell out of here. Get the hell out of here. The last guy did the same thing. You were the guardian? Yes, and you just broke my glasses. You the last guy did the same damn thing. You just body slammed me and broke my glasses. That's good reporting right there, okay? <laughs> he knows there's no video, so he's narrating his own body slam. <laughs> I just don't know how anyone 
could vote for a candidate who body slams people. You've never seen Donald Trump fight like this. I forgot. <laughs> Nothing matters. Now, of course, that is tying in with the election of Greg Gianforte <clears throat> in Montana. It was very much a Republican safe seat. He was expected to win it, but nobody quite expected him to body slam a reporter who'd asked what was a fairly respectful, polite question simply about health care when he got body slammed and his glasses were broken. Uh, now, Mr Gianforte has been charged with assault, it is worth noticing, uh, but uh, lots of people commenting online. So the body slammer wins while the president shoves NATO folk around. We're officially a country that champions bullying. Well done. So a lot of people really disappointed with the way that the US is being seen worldwide right now. Okay, well, thank you very much indeed for that. Emma James, not sure whether to laugh or cry after <laughs> uh, your, your update there. Well, that's it from me. The World News will be at 8pm Paris time. Thank you very much indeed for watching. Stay with us here on France 24.